Good evening, everybody. I hope today finds you well. I say evening as the sun is shining. Um, just like on Sunday night, I'm pre-recording this video. We are in Romans chapter 10. So naturally, my Bible's flipped open to Colossians. <laughs> um, but I, I think this is an important lesson. This is something that um, we can't stress enough how important this book is. Romans 10, if you're looking for a, a course in renewing your mind towards Christ. If you're looking for a way to get close to Jesus, Romans is the is the is the book you need to read. Now, um, we've got to remember that a lot of the concepts discussed in this, we can take it and 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 run in a direction it was never meant to go. So we've got to ask ourselves why Paul was writing this. Paul was writing this because you had two different groups, ethnic groups, within the church in Rome that were at odds with each other. And Paul was looking to even diversify the faith even more, pushing westward towards Spain. But he couldn't do that if there was a church that was a strong and big church fighting in his back. I understand that there's a lot of differences a lot of people have in the church. But if it's not grounded in the word of God, why do we fight against it? You know, uh, a motto of the, the Restoration Movement churches, Church of Christ, Christian churches, is in essentials, unity, in opinions, liberty, in all things, love. And so what was happening? Well, the, the emperor at the time, I think it was Claudius, I could be wrong. I, I'm, I could be wrong, so I want to make sure I, I'm amending that now. Had removed all the, Ro all the Jews from Rome and from the province for a time because... He was looking at them as seditious. And so when they were finally allowed to come back in, this church that was started by both Gentile and Jewish believers, apart from Paul, it, it, it was because the gospel was spreading so greatly. The Jewish believers came back in, and the Gentile believers weren't practicing the, the Hebrew customs. The, the law and, and, and the prophets uh, had stated that they follow and that they had been following since birth. And so... What we're seeing here, what Paul is addressing here, what we need to make sure we're focusing on is not Calvinism and Arminism and all that other stuff that people like to talk about that makes your head hurt when they get together and the smartest people in the room want to talk about it. It's the fact that the law cannot save us. We are saved by grace through faith. That Paul has a burden for the Jewish people. That Paul does love the Jewish people. However, some have rejected Christ in favor of the law. The law cannot save. It is only by grace through faith. And so in grace through faith, we are one people, Jew and Gentile, male and female, slave and free. We are all brothers, everyone who is made in the image of God. And guess what? Your skin pigmentation does not disqualify you. It doesn't make you any less in the image of God than I. We are all made in the image of God. All of us come from Adam and Eve. All of us come from the line of Noah. All of us can be saved by Jesus Christ through grace, through faith. So, we need to make sure that when we are reading these verses, we're not reading into it things that are not there or things that were never meant to be put there. We need to understand why. And again, my purpose, my, my hope, my goal is that all of us would have, since we have our phones, and I'm going to dig mine out of my pocket, our phones, we've got Bible apps. I'm going to show you. You know, here's just a few Bible apps on my phone. I've got all these Bible apps on my phone. Most of us have some sort of Bible app on our phone. We have something to help us study the Word. We need to not remain ignorant of the Word. We need to make sure that we are looking to understand and study the best we can. In Paul's day, most of these letters were written by a, uh, a scribe as Paul transcribed them. Paul would write these sermons together with his ministry team. They would talk to the scribe and they would transcribe this. And then this scribe would go and either hand it to the most educated person who could read or read it as Paul read it to him. And everybody would take these words and put them to heart. They would commit them to memory, and they would pass it to the other churches. That's how we got most of these scriptures. And so we need to understand 
that when we are reading this, we're not trying to put into it what's not there. We are trying to hear the word of God and let the Holy Spirit interpret it for us. We are trying to hide the words of God within our hearts so that God may reign supreme in our lives and that no matter what we face, whether trials, tribulation, persecutions, uh, flood, famine, fire, earthquake, whatever we may face, we are confident because of what the word of the Lord has preached and has interpreted by the Holy Spirit has told us. That being said, let's jump right into chapter 10. Brothers, and when he says brothers here, I want you to understand he's using the word in a pluralistic term. A lot of translations will translate it brothers and sisters. So when he says brothers, he means family, church family. My heart's desire and prayer to God concerning them, meaning Israel, is for their salvation. You might recall, we talked about this last week. Paul had a burden on his heart for the Jewish people, for Israel. Why? Because God had chosen them. They were chosen by God. Jesus was Jewish. It, he wasn't a Greek. And because salvation came to them, and, and wholesale, not, not completely, but, but as, as a majority, they, they rejected him. Paul had a burden on his heart, and we should as well. But also we should have a burden on our heart for the unsaved and the lost. Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God concerning them is for their salvation. That should be our burden. I can testify about them that they are, uh, have zeal for God, but not according to knowledge, because they disregarded the righteousness from God and attempt to establish their own righteousness. They have not submitted themselves to God's righteousness. What's he talking about? They had traditions to teach them to follow God's law. And if they had just simply read through the scriptures if they had dedicated themselves to the scriptures instead of the traditions, they would have seen clearly who Jesus was. Because they disregarded the righteousness of God and attempt to establish their own righteousness, they have not submitted themselves to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. To everyone who believes... You see, the cross has the final word. Why? Because Jesus said, it is finished, and he meant it was done. Oh, I'm getting fired up, and it's only a few minutes into this. Jesus said, it is finished. Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Jesus, who John says spoke and all things came into being. The word of God in the flesh was among them, and they, they rejected him. But he is our righteousness for those of us who believe. For Moses writes, verse 5, about the righteousness that is in the law. The one who does these things will live by them. In other words, it's not an outward expression. You know, I talked about this in a video on, on Friday. And uh, I say it's funny because today's Friday when I'm recording it, but I'm speaking of Friday because... When you're hearing this, it's Wednesday. I posted this video on Friday and I said this. You know, in in VBS, Vacation Bible School, and in church camp and in, in many things, we have the kids say a pledge to the Bible and we hold it up and we say, I will hide its words in my heart that I might not sin against God. What Paul is saying here is exactly that. They knew the words up here. But as far as hiding them in their heart, Jesus said these words, and, and he said it's not what goes into a man that defiles him, but it's what comes out. And he said, for out, or the, the heart, is, it's got a connection to the mouth, and out of the heart comes lust and greed and idolatry and, all, and adultery and all sorts of things. And so what Paul is trying to get at here is it's a hardened heart that rejects Christ. And you can often tell by the fruit of someone's lips what is said. And by what is said and what is done, their actions reflect their hearts. Their words reflect their hearts. You know, um, we've heard the expression, talk is cheap. And to a degree it is, if it is not backed up by action. 
And so I want to encourage you, you know, let us break the cycle of biblical ignorance. I, I, I'm reading the prophets right now. I'm in Ezekiel. I just finished Jeremiah and Lamentations. And what hurt Israel, what drove them away from their land was they forgot the word of God. We're doing a kid's video. Um, we do kids videos every single week and, and they're just a joy to do. But as we're doing the kids video, it even states there, you know, God told Moses in, in, in one of the videos we just finished that my people will forget my word and here's a song to help bring them back. If we want true restoration in our country, it's got to begin with us in our hearts and it's got to get back to the word of God. Paul, or sorry, Paul, God told Solomon at the dedication of the temple, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, and if they seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear them from heaven. I will forgive them and I will heal their land. We are not going to see any healing, any movement in our own lives or the lives around us unless we ourselves humble ourselves, admit that we are sinners in need of a savior and come before our God in repentance. It's the only way it works. And it's unfortunate that so many of us, we choose, we choose ourselves and choose our wants and our wishes and our desires and our feelings over Almighty God. It's a shame. Paul writes this, but the righteousness that comes from faith speaks like this. Do not say in your heart, who will go up to heaven, that is, to bring Christ down, or who will go down to the into the abyss, that is, to bring Christ up from the dead. On the contrary, what does it say? The message is near you, in your mouth, and in your heart. That's exactly what Jesus is saying. If we surround our lives, and, and I'm going to admit to you, I'm still doing this, trying to get rid of TV shows, trying to get rid of things, trying to get rid of entertainments. If in our hearts we let our entertainments destroy us, if in our hearts we let the things of this world take us, if in our hearts we are feeding those things out of our mouths and in our actions are going to show what we truly worship, if we hide God's word and we meditate on it, and I'm not speaking Eastern meditation where we empty our minds, I'm saying, being still with the Word of God, inviting the presence of God, inviting God to humbly take us over, we're going to see a change in our hearts. You know, I've got all these books back here, and I'm going to admit to you, I've read a lot of them, I've thumbed through most of them, but they do me no good if they just sit on my shelf. I mean, they're a nice backdrop, don't get me wrong. And this is a nice trophy if I don't read it and if I'm not in it and if I don't study it and if I don't seek God through it. This does me no good. It does me absolutely no good unless I am in this and transformed by it. We're going to get into that in chapter 12 here in a few weeks. But I wanted to bring that to you because I think it's important. These words have the ability God says through his word, my word will not come back void. These words, the gospel preached through the word of God, has the ability to change the heart of anyone, but it takes humility, and we have to see our need. All of us need it. When Jesus uh, was hanging out with tax collectors and sinners of all sorts, prostitutes and all these people, the Pharisees disapproved of it. And they questioned the disciples, and Jesus, knowing their hearts, looked at them and said, hey, is it the sick who need a doctor or the healthy? In other words, if you don't feel like you're in need of a doctor, I can't help you. If you don't feel like your soul is sick, I'm not for you. If you don't feel the need of a savior, I can do nothing there. But these people who are sick, these people who you rejected, these people who are, are, are daily reminded of their own failures, they need me. It's the same as when Jesus told the parable of the the Pharisee and the tax collector. There's this Pharisee who goes before the altar at synagogue and he just starts talking about how wonderful he is. 
Lord, I thank you that I follow all the commandments, that I give a 10% of everything I make, that I do all these things. Lord, look how wonderful I am, and I'm not as bad as the guy back there. But the, the tax collector in the back was so downtrodden, he couldn't even lift his eyes. Back then, they would lift their eyes up and pray to heaven. He just beat on his chest. And he said, have mercy on me, a sinner. And I, I know many of us can relate to that. And Jesus asked the Pharisees who came up to him, which one of these men walked away more justified before God? And they were forced to admit that it was the man of humble heart, the tax collector, the blood traitor to the people. Jesus often did things like that. He would use those examples. They were extreme, but they were true. The problem with the Pharisees and the problem with many in Israel was, and, and to a degree is, we need to pray for Israel and its restoration and salvation. We need to pray for the salvation of our enemies. We need to pray for the salvation of those uh, who are lost that are our neighbors and our co-workers and our friends and our family. But let's pray for a humbling of heart. We need to be humble, all of us. When we approach the gospel and we approach our friends and neighbors with the gospel, we need to be humble. The gospel has true power and humility because when we are humble, we step aside and we say, okay, Lord, you work. Lord, you move. James writes, he resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. So church, I'm, I'm asking you, where's your heart? Are, are you in the law? Look how great I am. Look at all these things I've accomplished. Look how well I follow. Or are you following grace? Are you saying, okay, Lord, I, I'm a sinner. I'm in need of a savior. And I need you because I cannot do this on my own. Are you healthy in your own eyes? Or do you see your sickness? That's where we need to be. I do this every day. I'm a sinner every day. I need to get on my knees every day. I don't always. But the Lord reminds me. There's times I, I just feel so unworthy. I weep. But he reminds me who I am. And I thank the Lord that he keeps me humble. Even though I am a sinner, I stay humble. And I know who my God is. And I'm not saying this to boast, but I just can only brag on how great my God is because it's not by my works. It's not by what I can do. It's not by the things I have done. It is only by him and him alone. It is by grace through faith that I am saved at all. It is by grace through faith I'm allowed to preach and teach the word of God. It is by grace through faith that I have a wonderful wife and partner in ministry and these great kids who I'm trying to raise to be young men who are humble. And so I want to ask you to do the same. Be humble. Listen to this. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Now listen to these words. Something we fail is... is This word means he is my master and I am his slave. When you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, we need to understand the brevity, the weight of all that. When I confess with my mouth Jesus is Lord, I am saying he has the rights to everything. All of me, everything I have, everything I own, everything belongs to him. None of it is mine. I... I I have no claim and I have no rights on anything. It is all him. When I say that, I give up the rights to myself. And I have to. Because if I don't, then I'm glorifying myself either on his level or above him. Then I no longer have a need of him. And then I'm dooming myself to eternity away from him. Listen to this. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, he is my master, he is my, my ruler, I am his slave, his bondservant. And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Let that be a reflection of your heart. He is my master. Wherever he leads, I'll go. Whatever he says, I'll do. I am his forever. believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And I know there's somebody who's going to watch this who's not saved, and I'm begging you. Search your heart and see if you find even anything wrong with yourself. 
and you look at your life, and even though you may have the things in this life that you desire, ask yourself, am I happy? Truly. Am I joyful? Truly. And see. Ask yourself. We all need Jesus. Every one of us. Everybody who is sucking air. Because those who aren't, there's nothing we can do for them anymore. But you see him. See a need. Look into yourself. And if you are not saved, I want to implore you, talk to somebody. Message me. Even though I'm, I'm right now spending time with my family, there is always time for the gospel. There is always room for salvation. I want to see you in heaven with me. I want to see you next to me. I want to see you hugging Christ alongside me. I want to see you in the presence of our Father and God together. That's my treasure in heaven. That's what I'm looking for. That's what I want to do. And just like Paul wrote in verse, or chapter 9, I, I, I'd risk my own salvation for yours. I, I pray the Lord places this burden on your heart. We all need to be saved. And there's one Savior, and that's Jesus Christ. One believes with the heart, resulting in righteousness, one confesses with the mouth, resulting in salvation. Now, Scripture says, everyone who believes on him will not be put to shame. So you see, you confess and you believe, and it gives you righteousness. Believing, saying, okay, Lord, I trust you. Whatever happens, even if I don't get what I want, even if I don't get the things that I desire in this life, whatever life gives me, if I go to prison, if I'm beaten, if I go to jail, if people ridicule me, if I don't get that relationship or that promotion or, or that thing that I want, if I'm living in poverty, but I have you, Lord, it is enough. I confess with my mouth and I believe with my life that you are God and you are enough. That is what he's saying and that is what we need to be. And I'm praying that for you. Please pray for that for me and my family. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek since the same Lord of all is rich to all who call on him. We're all brothers. Whether you have dark skin or light skin, whether you come from this background or that, whether you're American or not, whether you're this or that or the other, if we are in Christ together, we are brothers and sisters and all of us are blessed by the same Father. And I love you. And I'm praying for you. Because as one part of the body suffers, so we all suffer. As one has joy, so we all have joy. Let us seek God in one another that we may show the world what true peace and unity looks like. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Humble yourself. Let him be your master and call on his name and he will come and rescue you. But you gotta call. But how can they, verse 14, call on him they have not believed in? And how can they believe without hearing about him? And how can they hear without a preacher? And how can they preach unless they are sent? It is our job, all of us, to go and give this message. We, as the church, are the last great hope of the world. Why? Because we know the light of the world. And he has put us in the world to give a message to a dark world that is lost, that any who will hear and call upon his name will be saved. But if we don't preach, they won't know. If we don't speak, they won't hear. If we don't go when we are called, no one is going to get saved. Go. As it is written, same half of verse 15. How beautiful are the feet of those who announce the gospel of good things. That's in the book of Isaiah. How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. But all did not obey the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message? So faith comes from what is heard or, hate or hearing. And what is heard comes through the message about Christ or the word of God. That's faith comes by hearing and hearing through the word of God. I'm reading through the Holman Christian Standard Bible and that's how it translates this. Faith comes from what is heard and what is heard comes through the message about Christ. Preach. 
people need to hear it. If you preach the gospel, people will hear it. If you preach the good news, people will hear it and they will be saved. Stop being outraged. Go and preach the truth in love. And what people do to you is on them. How they receive the message is on them. Just go and preach. Do what Jesus calls. He loves you. And he has good things for you. Even in the middle of a dark, troubled world with persecution and tribulation, he's overcome already. And we will hear those words well done if we are faithful to the calling he has placed on us. But I ask, did they not hear? Yes, they did. The voice has gone out to all the earth and the words to the ends of the inhabited world. But I ask, did Israel not understand? First, Moses said, I will make you jealous of those who are not a nation. I will make you angry by a nation that lacks understanding. And Isaiah says boldly, I was found by those who were not looking for me. I revealed myself to those who were not asking for me. But to Israel, he says, all day long I have spread out my hands to a disobedient and defiant people. My prayer is that they do get jealous of those of us who are not a nation. Because I have a brother who's Kenyan. I have a brother from Pakistan. I have a brother in China. I have brothers and sisters all over the world of different backgrounds and nationalities because we have the same Father in God through our Lord Christ Jesus. And my prayer is that those who are outside, Israel first and those second, see our unity and our love for one another and they become jealous and yes, persecution will come with that. But maybe some will be stirred to jealousy and saying, why don't I have that? I follow a, 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 a ministry called One for Israel. And it's a beautiful ministry. It speaks of uh, many uh, Israeli Jews and, and American Jews and, and Australian and, and, I mean, Jews from every background and nationality who have come to meet Yeshua. That's Jesus' name in Hebrew. Yeshua is, is Joshua, which is closest to what Jesus' name was in um, in the Bible, we, we translate it from a, a Greek, Jesus, um, which is where we get Jesus. Anyhow, wait, one common thread comes through very many of their testimonies. I'm jealous of these Gentiles who seem to know my scriptures and my God better than I do. And at the end of their testimony, they say, I met Jesus. And now I feel I'm complete as a Jew. We need to pray for that. Pray for more. You know, in 1946, when um, Israel was a nation, or 47, I'm, I forget which, there were 30 Christians. Now there are 30,000, and it's growing. We want to see the day of the Lord come. And, and I'm going to tell you, be careful what you wish for. That's going to be a terrifying and awesome day all at once. We want to see the day of the Lord come. We need to preach the gospel. We need to pray for Israel we need to pray for, for the lost. We need to preach the gospel because if you want to see the kingdom, you need to be the kingdom. You're going to see it here in this life now. And then when you get to eternity, oh, when we are glorified in the presence of the Father, you will see the labor that the Holy Spirit did through you. I hope this makes sense. I hope there's any clarity. Uh, please feel free to ask questions. Um, ask in the comments. Ask anything. I'll answer them when I get back. Um, from my rest and I pray I pray that we together will, will just grow in our understanding and grow in our faith in Christ. God bless you. We love you. We'll see you next week.